Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking sports locally and nationally. Join the conversation on our social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome to another edition of the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. I'm your host, Ken M. Joining me in studio, as always, it's Padawan J. Daniel Jones! And joining us in studio, especially with that tagline coming right before him, your coach, my coach, the coach, Coach Duffy. He has arrived. Yes. Oh, we are going to get into that story and many, many more sports and pro wrestling topics just after we give you our socials where you can find us on social media. You can find our Facebook, our Instagram, our Twitter on OchoDuroParlayHour.com. And remember to use the hashtag, hashtag ODPH to join in the conversation because, boy, do we have a lot to discuss. We're going to kick off with some NFL recap action. You know Locks and Leaps is in full effect. So, Pad, why don't you start us off, break it down for us. Sure. Well, for my lock last week, uh, I decided to take the Baltimore Ravens over the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, they decided to win that game for me uh, by a final score of 23-17. to Lamar Jackson, 24 of 37 for 272 yards passing, two touchdowns. Kyler Murray, just an abysmal day. Well, it's kind of abysmal. 25 of 40 uh, for 349 yards passing, no touchdowns, no interceptions. Coach, let me ask you this. Is Lamar Jackson the truth? Is he the real deal? I mean, he's certainly better than any other running back I've seen play quarterback. Uh, uh, I see what you I, did there. Uh, I mean, he he definitely – I. Uh, it's an early set of games here. I mean, obviously Miami is – Awful. I mean, to put it nicely, they're bad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then, you know, obviously an Arizona team that has a, a better defense. Yeah, they're young, though. Yeah, they're, but a better defense than Miami's defense, but yeah. still, yeah. nonetheless, not a very good defense. They have a very good test coming up next week in Oof. Kansas City. In Kansas City. In yes. Kansas So that will be a very telling sign to whether, uh, you know, Lamar's really, you know, progressed as far as year, you know, year two of being a, a starting quarterback. So, yeah, it will be interesting to see next week, but... <laughs> I mean, more power, too. He's killing it right now. Oh, so you bring up next week. The uh, week after is also going to be an interesting test because the following week, week four, they uh, face Cleveland at home. Yeah, there you go. So, I mean, back-to-back, you know, good good games for him to finally, you know, really show that he is the, you know, what he's doing right now and back it up. It'll be the real test for him. I mean, right now out of the gate, he is looking amazing right now, and he mm-hmm. has been the spark that the Ravens, I think, have needed. Joe Flacco has been always an adequate quarterback. Yeah. Has he been elite? Debatable. Very debatable. Yeah, very. In my opinion, not really. I mean, probably not worth that contract that he got a couple years ago. Definitely not worth that contract. Definitely not. But you can't fault him on getting that. And obviously, when the Ravens made the switch and go all in on Jackson, they made the right move so far. I mean, he he was a very good quarterback to get the job done for you and get you through to the season. But when it came to crunch time... And and the time you need your quarterback, you know your your franchise guy to step up and make the big plays, like a Brett Favre, like a Peyton Manning, like a uh, Tom Brady or Aaron Rodgers. You know, if you tell me I got to pick somebody else or or Joe Flacco, well, I'm kind of weighing each option there. Like it's not a guaranteed all. Yeah, I got to go with Joe Flacco. Well, I mean, after coming back from last year and how the season finished out for him, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely been a night and day difference. Yes. Well, I think they're also now that they've finally got a handle on the skill set that he has. You know, a whole entire off season of being able to build an offense around him. So you know, put in plays that he can be successful with. I think that was probably the most important thing because now you just see the offense flows a little bit better than it did. In, you know, the year before when it was built around Flacco, then put in to Lamar Jackson. You know, now it's a whole entire year of an off season of working on, you know, the read option and kind of that spread set that they're running a little bit more of now um, that, you know, he's able to get on the outside and get to the edge and get not only just passing yards but rushing yards too. Yeah. And and it's different than Cam Newton because Cam, while he has the speed, they never have been able to get him outside and in space like Lamar Jackson's been able to do this year. Yeah. And that's what's the biggest difference between the two of them. Yeah, I mean, I brought up the passing yards on the flip side. He had 16 carries for 120 yards rushing, which was good for – best in his team and best of the day overall yeah i mean you have to plan for that you mm, got yeah. a game plan for that that's a that's 
a dual threat that we haven't seen since Michael Vick. Yeah, and probably a little bit better of an accurate, you know, an accurate thrower than Michael Vick was. Mm-hmm. It's going to be really interesting to see how he progresses thus far. Like we said, he has some pretty tough competition and a step up coming up with Kansas City. Yeah, and trying to keep up with yeah. Patrick Mahomes and the offensive juggernaut that Oof. they have going on right Oof. now. And then a division rival with Cleveland right after, yeah. which that is not going to be any easy task for both teams. No. So Baltimore definitely stepping in the right direction. Arizona still got to find their way. Yeah, I mean, honestly, Kyler Murray, jury is still out on right it, now. It's a bright future, but like we said, it's a young team. They got to find a few more pieces that fit in with whatever it is they want to do on the offensive side of the ball to really get things going. Yeah, I mean, we went into this with our preview show saying that Arizona was going to be, you know, of that division that is strong was going to be the weekend of that division. And yeah. I mean, that's the way that's holding out right now. Yeah, it's the way that's shipping up. Yep. But on the other side of the NFC West is the San Francisco 49ers. Pad, your leap. Yep, took the 49ers on a leap because uh, as we were recording, the Cincinnati Bengals were favored. Uh, San Francisco decided to go, ah, not so fast, my friends. Uh, San Francisco winning the game 41-17. to Jimmy Garoppolo, 17 of 25 for 297 yards passing. Three touchdowns, one interception. On the other side, Andy Dalton, 26 of 42 for 311 yards passing. Two touchdowns, one interception. Coach, your take on this. I mean, as of right now, the 49ers really, I mean, haven't – I know that we said in the off yeah, that Garoppolo after that preseason game was pretty telling. I mean, obviously his performance has shown otherwise. At the same time, though, they've played Tampa Bay and the Bengals. And while Tampa Bay's defense has improved – and, and is, you know, not the vaunted defense that it once was. It's no. still a better defense. And then the Bengals, not a very good defense. No. So, I mean, obviously these performances are what they need to be. Um, and they're games that they need to win. And obviously they're winning them pretty handily. The biggest thing to me is the backfield. and Matt Breda being able to separate yeah, himself. Jumping as far right as, in right now. Yeah, and separating himself as being the lead back that this uh-huh. team probably needs. I mean... You know, 25 passing attempts from Garoppolo isn't telling me that this is a team that needs to throw the ball right. very often, that they can rush and get first downs and then kind of work their way from there. Yeah, I mean, off the, on the passing side of the ball, too, they got some receivers who are really doing some work for them. You got Debo Samuel, who had f- uh, five catches for 87 yards, one touchdown. Marquise Goodwin, three catches for 77 yards and one touchdown. And then you had uh, Raheem Morstert, I think is how you say it, three catches for six, uh, 68 yards and one touchdown. So, I mean, it's just one of those things where, like, okay, you're looking at a Garoppolo for the season thus far 463 yards passing four touchdowns two interceptions not bad to start the season no definitely not and for the Niners you have to be very excited with yeah. what you're seeing thus far I yeah mean, obviously making that big move to get him out of New England where he was going to be the heir apparent mm-hmm. is really paying off now right and for the Bengals really with the new coaching staff you don't know what you're getting out of them yet. yeah I, and obviously without AJ Green it's a telling yeah telling sign that the yeah. offense is not clicking. I mean, he's arguably the biggest weapon they have. And oh, yeah. With him, not, with him not being there, it's a wholly different dynamic. Easily. And I know we brought up the you know their first two opponents. Next week they have the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers at home, and then they have a bye week before they take on Cleveland, the Rams, and then the Washington Redskins. No easy task moving forward. No, definitely not. So they're going to have to make some work happen and just be lucky they don't have to face New England. Woof. Now, Coach had them as his lock of the week, and dare I say, when we originally talked about this, yeah. the point spread was crazy for this. Yeah, it was, what was it, like 21, 22 and a half, something absurd like that? A couple places we read there, but we didn't go with that for the point spread. The point spread we took was the 19 for this, for the okay. Patriots. Yeah. So for Coach's lock of the Patriots. Oh, let's go. I mean, I mean, let, let listen. Me, let me before you jump in, Terry. Too, we didn't mention this on the show. The point spread I think we were reading was like eighteen and a half, nineteen and a half. The over under was like forty eight and a half. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I said, hey, I said, give me the points. I loved it. Now I didn't know. I didn't pick the over over as far as total points. Oh, I was. Just but curious. I loved the Patriots over, and I and I'm glad that I went with it. Uh, what can you say about this Miami team? They nothing. Suck. They're <laughs> nothing. terrible. Yeah. And I mean, obviously Antonio Brown assimilated himself yeah. right into the wide receiver core that they have and the weapons that they have. Um, obviously now whatever is going on there is going to be an issue yeah. moving forward. And it will be interesting to see how this Patriot team handles that because this is something that they've never seen before. You know, they've never really had to deal with controversy off the field so much so to the sense that there's litigation p- potential. So, but that's whatever. You know, we don't need to get into that. But right. They're they're dangerous offense, uh, yeah. regardless. Yeah. 
and Miami's Swiss cheese defense that it is right now. Obviously, they're uh, trading Minka Fitzpatrick yep. late last night to the Steelers yeah. for for yeah for first, third, and fourth. Yeah, crazy. It, that's it, the hole the Giants should have got for Odell from Cleveland. I yeah. mean, that's nuts for a guy who really hasn't performed well. No, granted. The situation hasn't been there, but Pittsburgh, I mean, obviously losing Ben, really, what are you chasing there with right. that? You know, I mean, so whatever. All right, so, but the Patriots, though, Pad, you should feel very comfortable. You should probably book your trip to my, to Miami right now, get your hotel room, get it lined up, because you guys will be there come February. The wild thing to me is is Brady every week, for those who don't follow him on social media, if they win, he'll put a little video together where he records something, and then it's highlights of the game set to a song. Thought about it, and he and correctly predicted in my head that he was going to use Will Smith's Miami song for the video, which he did. Uh, but it's, it's wild to me to think back to last week after the Sunday night game where he said, oh, you know, our offense still needs some work. Our, our offense still needs some work. Work? You've put up, what is it, 70-something points in two games, and your defense has given up three? Listen, what? I mean, to, and the fact that you shut out Miami just goes to show, because they gave up three to a very good Pittsburgh team. Yeah. You shut Miami completely out. I mean, what what was the offensive stats for Miami? Uh, give me two seconds. I can tell you okay. on that. So, uh, well, offensive stats for Miami. Got them here. Uh, right. 184 total yards. God. Uh, passing yards was 142. And Jeez. then rushing yards was 42. That's abysmal. Yeah. That is pathetic. Mm-hmm. To lose 43 <laughs> to nothing. And yeah. this was the game that Coach was saying. Could have been a trap game previously going into the season because usually the Patriots hey. don't perform in Miami. No, I'm not. I'm yeah. not, I'm not I'm, I'm, no, I know. I know. Hey, I said it. I said, listen, Pat, I put my money where my mouth is. I said New England was going to win this game. There was a reason I didn't. I could have easily picked it on last week's <laughs> show, but there's a reason I didn't. I know their record in New England the last exactly. five or six years, or my record in Miami. And you don't think that they didn't know that? Yeah, no, they do. I think every single podcast we interact with, shout out to So Wizard and Wondersoul, who are big Patriots fans that chime in, they were even like, yeah, we know it's Miami. We never do good down there. But no. I, currently, right now, I mean, the Patriots are looking like the absolute favorites right now in the NFL, and nobody's even close. The offense is working magic with, I mean, Antonio Brown just got there. So you can't say yeah. they have a superstar and he's the big X factor joining. No, but he fits. He fits in. And, and you know where he fits? In Gronk's role. Yeah. yeah. Not even playing tight end because I know he's a wide receiver. I'm just saying that he fits as that big body that Brady on a, you know, a third and three can get the ball to. And in the red zone especially. Right. The red zone especially was where they miss Gronk the most. Yeah. And that's where Brown is going to fit right into that niche. Yeah, I mean, Brown, four catches, 56 yards, uh, one touchdown. Not a bad game, but it's, you know, not monster numbers. But that's all he needs to do. Yeah. That's all he needs to do. That's all they need from him. Four yeah. catches for 40 to 50 yards, but that one TD is what they need from him. Yeah. I mean, the Patriots receiving had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven receivers oh, in double digits. he was digits. slinging it. He was oh, slinging yeah. it. He, he had seven receivers in double digits for receiving yards. Yeah, and Brady's going for 2028, 20, 264 and two. I mean, yeah. that's a, almost a near-perfect game. And I know that they just say, well, we have to keep working. That's the Patriots' way. Mm -hmm. yeah, they're, I, they're never going to give you bulletin board material, no, usually. No, you, no. There, there might be a fluke that happens if you're lucky. But the Patriots are just the elite class of the league right now. If I mean, that wasn't a former coordinator, they would have hung 60 on them. I, For I, sure. I, yeah. you're, you're not the first person I've seen say that, and I wasn't too sure. And the more I thought about it, yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, if Adam Gase was still down there, oh, they would have dropped 60 easy. They would have hung it on them. That's what they're going to do this weekend. Yeah, uh -huh. which we'll get into a little later in the show. But speaking of elite classes in the NFL. Yep. The leap you took, Coach, was good on paper, but unfortunately a big injury has happened that yeah. kind of curbtailed that. Yeah, I mean, obviously I picked the Saints for my leap because, I mean, in the preview show I said that this was going to be a vengeance tour. Yeah. And no further you had to look than what was circled on the calendar in week two. Aaron Donald must have been listening. Coming to Los Angeles, looking for that vengeance, seeking that vengeance. Getting screwed over by the refs again. And then breaking your thumb. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, Drew Brees is now done for, and they, they at least projected at least six weeks. Six, yeah, six so weeks. That hurts. That hurts them. That hurts me and my fantasy team. Yeah. That hurts my heart with my pick for the Super Bowl. Same <laughs> I mean, here. Same here. Yeah. So we might have to do a week seven uh, review, a uh, repick show to to repick uh, NFC favorites. Um. Yeah. I mean, what else can you say? You can't. 
This team is built and go- and is carried. No matter how many times they can give the ball to Alvin Kamara, uh, yeah, it's built on Drew Brees' shoulders. Yeah, I mean, you look at it where, yeah, they, okay, you've got Kamara, and then you've still got your receivers, you know, Jared Cook, Latavius Murray, Michael Thomas, Traquan Smith, who are all very good. But let's be honest, the Saints are nothing without Drew Brees. Like, they're done without Drew Brees. Yeah, Teddy Bridgewater, I mean, I'm sorry, he played serviceable, yeah. but he's he it cannot was, do the same Drew thing. It, yeah. it was serviceable, but you instantly saw the game plan as, okay, we don't have Drew Brees' arm. Hand the ball off to Kamara, which they only did 13 times. Right, because at that stage, you can't really do nothing. I mean, when the Rams are jumping on you early, and granted, halftime, it was back and forth. It was 6-3. Yeah. But the Rams came right out the gate in the third quarter, dropping 14, and with the final being 27-9, they made the statement that they said, okay, let's make sure that this is definitive, not coming down to a ref call. To Can we do. put nine with an asterisk, though? Because uh, one touchdown got called back that probably should not have. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can, but overall, like when Breeze I went know. down. I'm yeah. just oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. But when Breeze went down, it was a whole different game. And Jared Goff, I mean, he definitely took advantage, throwing for 283 and one. Todd Gurley played well. Yeah. <laughs> that he did. Had my heart very happy. <laughs> I might have been crying on the inside with Drew Brees going down, but I was very happy on the outside with Todd Gurley finally showing up. Yeah, yeah, going for 63-1, and one, you can't go wrong with that. But the Rams looked very good out the gate. Yeah, and I mean, you talk about the Drew Brees being out for six weeks. I'm, I'm looking at their schedule. So the next six games they've got are at Seattle. L. Uh, uh, home against Dallas. L. Home against Tampa Bay. Win. Home, or at Jacksonville. Mm, win. At Chicago. Uh, and, then, and then home against Arizona, where they have a bye week in week nine. Win. So three and three in that time yeah. that he's out. I yeah. mean, roughly. Because that, Jackson, that Jacksonville could be an L2. I mean, yeah. And that's, yeah, if he comes back. I mean, the scariest thing was, you know, Troy Aikman on the broadcast, which I know, I mean, I don't know whether you love him or hate him. I'm not huge on him, just being the fact that when I got to listen to him do the Giants games, it's always bad yeah. when I used to play the Giants. So, you know, I, I try not to, to uh, listen to it, but. You know, he was just talking about the fact that there's two different styles of quarterback with grip in the ball. There's guys that are, you know, he was saying that are thumb heavy, like he was back in his day, where you know he really relied on his thumb to grip the ball. And then there's other guys who put a little less pressure on the ball, but you know, quicker release. You know, obviously with some of those patterns that they throw with Michael Thomas, they're going deep, so he's probably putting a little more pressure, and he couldn't even put thumb pressure on the ball i mean the, the confusing thing to me the entire time is and we've seen this in in previous games with other teams player gets injured if they're not coming back they come out of the locker room at halftime and they're in like a, a jacket and sweatpants right they at least take off their, right. their shoulder pads breeze was out there in full uniform including shoulder pads something and i'm sitting there and i know i probably wasn't the only one going maybe he's coming back the whole time i i not the whole time obviously once they list him list yeah. him out i was yeah. like all right but when i saw them wrapping his thumb after the hit i was like he's gonna give this a go yeah. this son of a gun is gonna give this a go well he's one of those old school mentalities oh, for like, sure as long Arm, as he can arms walk on off. the field yeah yeah, yeah. He's, he's gonna get out there and go and he, and absolutely because i mean he my god what was his first year or second year with the chargers he played with that torn shoulder yeah like mm-hmm. the entire year and it yeah. was his throwing shoulder yes yeah, so That's nuts you have to give the respect to him and he's gonna try getting back from this injury as quick as possible it's just a matter of time frame. I mean, I, mean, I hope he does because I, I can't rely on Deshaun Watson to be my starting quarterback yeah. for my fantasy team the entire year. <laughs> I can't do it. I mean, listen, I got him on one of my fantasy teams, but at least I got a backup in Phillip Rivers. Hey, listen, I Deshaun Watson's a fine. He was the he's, he's a, the number one ranked QB the last two weeks in a row. I'm just saying, yeah, like, yeah. you know, he's got a bye week. He's got some bad matchups. You know, I kind of uh, rely on Drew a little bit, you know? Exactly. And with the quarterbacks going down this past weekend, it's always scary when you're dropping team, like flies. Your team relies on him too. I mean, Breeze is so instrumental to the Saints' success. Big Ben in Pittsburgh, when now he's out the year with uh, elbow surgery. Yep. Sam Darnold went down with Sam, Mono. Sam Darnold went down. I mean, that was a catalyst be. for just the Jets unraveling <laughs> this week. Yeah, yeah, and then all of a sudden, Trevor Simeon goes down with a broken leg. I mean, that the foot, that whole thing, that was nasty. To yeah. go into my lock, I stuck with the Browns. I got. Never left the bandwagon. Yeah, sure he didn't. Right, Pat? Yeah. I mean, uh-huh. I never uh-huh. left it. I just, I just <laughs> said that first week was a good eye-opener, and they definitely took advantage of it. Albeit, though, the Jets were banged up in more ways than one, with Mono taking over for Sam Darnold there. 
and he was out for the game. Yeah. I mean, it got to the point with this game where, of course, as has been well reported, Sam Darnold is out for the next couple of weeks with mono, and if you've had that, it's not the most fun in the world. Uh, they're saying it could be up to six. Yeah, well, yeah, which is nuts. Yeah, it's four so, to six weeks yeah. usually. So they so they had Trevor Simeon come unofficial in. medical opinion. Sure. So they had Trevor Simeon come in, and he would be serviceable. He'd get him through it, but then he broke his leg, and in comes <sighs> Luke Falk, and, and everyone's going, "Wait, who?" <laughs> And, yeah. and so then you had, <laughs> and then you had the sideline reporter coming out of halftime, going, "All right, so God forbid your your third string quarterback comes gets hurt. Who's your emergency? Le- Le'Veon Bell. Le'Veon baby. Bell. Holy yeah. cow, we're getting to that point. Who was banged up from his shoulder a little bit too? There, uh-huh. I mean, he had, did have the MRI and everything looked okay. Hey, they sure. were feeding him the rock, and they had to. Yeah, it's the smart move to do. I mean, if you're going to have him come in, you're paying him that much money with all the free agency nonsense that happened in the offseason, you got to give him the ball. He is your best playmaker, let's mm-hmm. be honest. Yep. Yeah. And especially when your quarterback, like I said, Mono took out Sam Darnold. Yep. Trevor Simeon, unfortunately, broke his ankle, I believe. Yeah. I th- I th- it was it a leg, ankle or was like his heel? It, it was something leg injury. nasty. Okay. Yeah. I oh. did not see the replay, and I heard enough about yeah. it, and that's all I need to go with it. Yo, I'll say, though, Miles Garrett was – I mean, he was laying hits. Mm-hmm. He yeah. was laying the boom. And he was a little possessed. I, I mean, a side tangent here, if we will, fellas. Sure. Then if you're going to call these hits, these aggressive hits on the quarterback, uh, unprotected player, whatever they're calling it, uh-huh. that needs to be, if you get a third, a second and a third, it has to be a disqualification. That has to be what this results in. Yeah. They have to do something yeah. with it. Because, my God, the first hit he laid on him, was I mean the ball was away mm-hmm. and then he went right. full body weight on him. Right. And then the second one, all right, yeah, he was still holding on to it, but he could have pushed him. Right. And you I, know I, and I think the NFL needs to do like college football does. And I know in the instance I'm about to reference, I think the NFL's adapted this, but I know college football has the thing where it's if it's two uh fouls for leading with the helmet, helmet to helmet contact, they'll review it. And yeah. if you get assessed for the second helmet to helmet leading with the helmet flag you're done well they'll throw you out for the first one if you right. do if the first one's questionable they'll yeah. review it if it's not then if you do it again though yeah. then you're out i think the nfl needs to do something like that with with these hits though it's you got to start doing something yeah well, I, I think they have to find a fine balance because i know last year we were very critical about the roughing the pass exactly calls. so now it's kind of now at the but other extreme end i think the difference is though that these two hits that he had were so so oh, obvious I the definition you. of the word of it you i know? grant you yeah no i'm not making an excuse for that no they were the definition so this is where the nfl needs to jump in and make swift action and define it. Right. And yeah. make sure it's very clear there is no gray areas that this is the stipulation. If you cross this, this is what happens. They literally should just show that when they do the review committee and like yeah. when they're doing the refs and be like, This is our definition of it. Show that game tape. Yeah. Because that's yeah. all you need to show. I mean, it was one unfortunate incident for the Jets and obviously going I mean, to your third string quarterback. Never a good look. With the Patriots next week. With uh-huh. the Patriots coming in town next week for the Browns. Oh, God. I mean, they definitely yep. bounce back in a big way. Baker Mayfield with 325-1, and one, and Nick Chubb with 62-1 and one running the ball. I mean, they looked like the Browns we thought we were going to see. Yeah, I mean, OBJ was going to. Yeah, you he know. had the one-handed catch. That Whatever. I don't care. Yawn. I don't care. Yawn. Yeah, I've seen it. No, I mean, I'm looking at the Jets schedule. Uh, they better hope Sam Darnold gets back quickly because, my God, if they got to stick with their third-string quarterback here for the next couple of weeks, they're going to get eaten alive. No, they, I mean, somebody somebody will get signed this week. I they mean, have to. Because I'm looking at the Jets schedule. As we mentioned, they're going up to New England uh, this coming week. Then they've got a bye week in week four. Listen to this schedule. At Philly, uh, at home against Dallas, at home against the Patriots, LLL, and then you've got at Jacksonville and at Miami. Yeah, that's so all. Else. Maybe, Ooh. maybe Miami. Till Miami, Ooh. yeah, maybe. Uh, I mean, I. Uh, you have to call Kaepernick. Yeah, you don't have a choice. You have yeah. a team that's on the cusp of a playoff run with your quarterback now out six weeks at the minimum. You don't have anybody else. I mean, who else is even a free agent right now? There isn't there, any. there isn't anybody. There's nobody out there. Well, I'm sure there is, but they're not anybody really worth anything. Right. Not not at the level that Kaepernick could play at. I mean, yeah. Deshaun Kaiser's a free agent. Is anybody gonna go seek out his phone number? Uh, I'm probably. sorry, Deshaun. You're a Notre Dame guy. I appreciate what you did, but I'm not calling you. You have to start looking at who's a backup on a team and maybe try making a deal. Or you, I agree. I mean, you, you could. That could be a route. That no, could be a route. But I agree. The Kaepernick should get a look. They do have Davis Webb on their practice squad. Oh, yeah. Lord. I mean, <laughs> there are some. There are some options the Jets and some other teams need to do. 
I mean, especially going into the latter half of the season. We're already week two, and like I say, when you start losing out the gate 0-2, 0-3, if you're going to salvage your season, you got to make a drastic move. Owen get someone. Owen four is very daunting. It's pretty much to come the death back from. now. Yeah, I mean, once you're Owen four, it's on un- very unlikely. To I mean, there is back. one team and one man who has done it, but you know, he's uh, riding the pine pony now. So oh, we'll get into that next segment. We have to finish out locks and leaps, though. Talking about my leap, so I did go two for two this week. I took Tampa oh, Bay. I went two for two. Oh, I'm I mean, sorry. So did I. I, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Still undefeated in locks and leaps this thus far. I gotta yeah, have my right, I gotta right. win. But who's got the championship? Oh, for now. For now. Oh, that's right. It's this guy. But Tampa Bay did defeat Carolina, twenty to fourteen. Uh what can you say about this? Tampa Bay it was a division hey. game. They stepped up. They did what they needed to do. Carolina. 0-2 out the gate, not yep. the best look for the can, team there. Can when you ask me for my review, can I just refer to my Cam Newton tangent from last week? Yes, you can. Sure. Right, replay that right now. Perfect. All right, thank you. Uh, there, yeah, I mean, what can you say? Like, this team, Carolina, should be better. You have one of the most dangerous running backs in all of the NFL. Mm-hmm. Your wide receiver core is... Adequate. Adequate. Good I mean, enough to get by. I mean, uh, they're adequate, but your leading receiver for this game was your tight end, Greg Olson. And, oh, and there's been. nothing the matter with that. There's nothing the matter with that. He's always been their number one go-to since he's I remember to a certain yeah. New England team that used to have their tight end be their number one pass catcher, too. Oh, that's true. Ooh. So I'm just saying. Uh, yeah, and then, you know, they and they got um the what's-his-face out of New England. Oh, yeah, uh, Kevin, uh, Chris Hogan. Yep, and they have... One catch for 12 yards. And they got Curtis Samuel. I mean, they've got weapons. It's just, you know, there's something... I'm not saying that it is, but there has to be something going on with Cam. He's not clicking right now, and it's got to be something to stem from that offseason shoulder surgery. See, you say that, and I'm looking at the numbers, and I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just looking at the numbers. Cam Newton, 25 of 51, 333 yards, no touchdowns, no interceptions. Okay, rushing side of the ball. Christian McCaffrey, 16 carries, 37 yards. Okay, listen to this receiving guard, and and somebody please tell me how. I'm not going to go through everything. I'll just go through the top three. How they did not score a touchdown with this. Greg Olson, six catches, 110 yards, no touchdowns. Curtis Samuel, five catches, 91 yards, zero touchdowns. DJ Moore, nine catches, 89 yards, zero touchdowns. How in God's green earth do you not score a touchdown with those numbers? Their red zone That's offense pretty, is awful. Yeah. Like Once they get inside the 20, I don't know, for whatever reason, I think they just try running the ball too much, and they get... It kind of looks predictable, in my opinion. Well, I'll say, I mean, the Giants used to have the same problem back in the day, and they had to change the mentality of calling it the red zone because they were, you know, like it was a mental thing, like red means stop. So they started Mm. calling it the green zone. Oh, okay. You know, so they started. And, I mean, I know Notre Dame implements uh, when you're within the 45, it's called the black. When you're within the 35, it's called the orange. Then it's the red, and then they have the green zone too. So a lot of teams implement different strategies when you're within that. But when you have a, a dual threat quarterback like Cam is, you have to be when you're inside that twenty. You you have to convert touchdowns. Yes, you don't have a choice, and you have to utilize his strength, which is not only just the ability to gun the ball in, to run the ball. I mean, according to the box sheet here, the the Panthers only had three attempts in the red zone, and they were over three. You're not going to get the job done that way. And no. Cam, I think, is more hurt than he's letting on. And obviously, I, yeah. if this is the play moving forward, Ron Rivera is going to be gone by midseason. Because they would be running him if mm. he wasn't injured. Yes. Yeah. I agree. I, and, and according to the box uh, score, he had two carries for zero yards. Yeah, because he got stuffed on a, a, a fourth and one uh, uh, quarterback sneak. Yeah. yeah. that's You can't have that, you know? No, Carolina has just got so many questions they got to answer. And like I said, Ron Rivera could be out of a job very shortly. Yeah, he's yeah I mean, come by week. I mean, 0 and 2 right now. What's, what's their schedule looking like, Pad? Pulling it up right. right now, of course, as you mentioned, they're 0 and 2. Uh, they're at the at Cardinals next week, a uh, week after they're at Houston. Uh, and Rain then they, they play Jacksonville at home and Tampa Bay at home. Uh, and then they have a bye week in week seven. So they could be 3 and 3 at, at best. best. Yeah. I see them going. Less than that, to yeah, be honest with and you. And then after the bye week, they've got the 49ers, Titans, Packers, Falcons, Saints, Redskins, Falcons again, uh, Seahawks, Colts, and then the Saints to close out the year. Needless to say, if they don't win the division and Drew Brees is out and they can't get separation between them and New Orleans, Ron Rivera will be fired at the end of the year. I think if they're still... Uh, you don't have a choice. If they're like 1-5 in five by the time they get to their bye week, because bye week's week 7, correct? Uh-huh. Yeah. He's gone. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I'm, not, I mean, I'm not if, wishing if, this on. Yeah, him, no, for sure. No, but, yeah, but you're yeah. right. No, yeah. I'm, I'm with Ken because you, like we said, Drew Brees is out for at least six weeks minimum. I'm I'm guessing, given the fact of who it is, it'll be a little longer. But if you can't take advantage of this division where Atlanta is suspect at best on any given Sunday, right? Tampa Bay also suspect on any given Sunday. Uh, New Orleans without Drew Brees, as we said, not a threat. If you cannot take advantage of that division because of the basically silver platter you've been gifted, you're gone. Yeah, I mean, and what year is the, like Ron Rivera is going on? What year? Like eight or nine at, at least. least. I he's, mean, he's had a pretty long tenure thus and far. They've only had maybe I think one NFC Championship game. If I'm like right that, under yeah. that, Bowl, under him, right? yeah. So, I mean, if a guy can win two Super Bowls and get fired in the middle of uh, a press conference, you know, you can too. Anything can happen for Carolina. They got to fix it. It was a good win for Tampa Bay, especially with the new regime they have there. So yeah, absolutely. You know they have to definitely take a feather in the cap. And for the NFC South teams, now is the time to strike because well, without I, New Orleans, I, Tampa Bay is that team that needs to look at that. Same with Atlanta. Yeah, they can definitely fly under the radar and make some moves. That's what we had for Locks and Leaps this week, so definitely hit us up on our social media. Hashtag ODPH. Join in that conversation. Give us your picks and what you thought of the games we covered because next segment we are giving the open mic to Coach <laughs> Duffy. Get your popcorn. Because there is a team he wants to talk about and a move that was made today. <laughs> a decision. Pop. Uh, get, pause the episode. Get a bag of popcorn. Orville Redenbacher. Maybe get it pop going. secret. Whatever you choose. Get, pop, some, pop, pop, get, pop, get pop. some butter if you like it. Maybe get a little seasoning put on it. We'll resume the episode because this is going to be good. Absolutely. So stay with us when we come back from break. You are listening to the ODPH podcast. Hey, this is Rob Kacharek from the band 607, Autopilot Off, and Walking Distance, and you're listening to ODPH. Coming back for the second segment on this edition of the ODPH podcast, and I guess we should give a warning. The thoughts, views, and opinions of that of Coach Duffy do not reflect the ODPH podcast in any way, shape, or form concerning this segment because he is going to go off as soon as I get done reading the stat line for the game of the week that we are going to break down, and that is the Buffalo Bills defeated the New York Giants 28-14. to and but, dare I, I mean, say, you can call them the king of New York, Ken. I did because they beat the Jets. They beat the Giants. They're the current reigning and defending kings of New York State. And I will take that. Josh Allen, 253 and one touchdown. Frank Gore, 68 he yards had and a more touchdown. Too. Devin Singletary, 57 and one. Josh Allen ran one in. I'm not sure going to run it into the Giants' face because after that opening drive when Saquon Barkley ran it down our throats, the Giants just decided to start passing, and they went off the tracks. And All right, let I'm, me hop in real quick before we go anywhere because that first drive, I'm sitting and I'm watching the game, and I'm watching just Saquon Barkley right, Saquon Barkley left, Saquon Barkley right, Saquon Barkley left. He's cutting in the middle of the hole. Buffalo can't touch him. Seven to eight yards every carry, and I'm like, oh, this is going to be the game plan. Yeah, no, this, I, is, this is the team that we've been waiting for. And then drive two came. And then drive three, and we were three and out, three and out. And I said we. I meant to say they. Three and out, three and out, three and out. And then I was like, there they are. That's the team we were waiting for. Yeah, I was sitting there with bated breath. I know my fellow Bills fans were. Shout out to Online Warriors Podcast because I know they're Bills fans too. And I think after that open drive, I think everybody was like, all right, this is going to be a long one. Uh -huh. And then the yeah. Giants decided to start throwing. And I'm sitting there just as a fan going, you ran it down Buffalo's throat. Ran it down. It, it was ugly. I would be the first one to tell you. I was like, it's going to be a long game. Well, and then Buffalo on that opening drive went 3-0. and out, And I was like, okay, all right. Yeah. The I, defense looks good. Then, obviously, the game went on. And I do want to say the second half, the defense looked better. They but, did. you know, it was what it was. No, the third quarter, they, they definitely looked really good. But Buffalo hung in there after they got out to that big lead going into halftime. And now, going into the future... There was a big change made. Coach, I'm handing you the mic. Listeners, you have been forewarned. Here we go. Listen, I think that this is the dumbest decision possible to do this week. You are going on the road into Tampa Bay to play the Buccaneers defense that is improved. With Ndamukong Sue and the secondary that they have, you're going to start your rookie quarterback in Daniel Jones, the sixth pick in the draft, Mr. 83% in the preseason, with wide receivers. Mr. Perennial Hall of Famer. Can you yep. name a Giants wide receiver right now, and you just watch them play Buffalo Ken Go? I plead the fifth. I'm looking at their receiving core right now. Evan Ingram. He's a tight end, but I'll give it to you, yes, because he was playing a lot of wide out. 
That's yeah. that's what they have right now. And uh, the Jones, TJ Jones. TJ Jones, who is the punt return, yes, and plays a little slot wide receiver. That's the only ones I that can name. He, mind you, was cut after the preseason. They're, that's what they're rocking right now. Cody Latimer, questionable because of the, uh, the hit that he got, so we don't know if he's going to play. Uh, Shepard with the concussion, don't yep. know if he's coming back. The other Shepard was injured as well during the game mm-hmm. against Buffalo. They don't know if he's going to play. And Golden Tate's out for another two weeks with the suspension from the failed PED test. Right. My God. So why would you send him into the Lions' den to face this team with no wide receivers on the books? Oh, yeah, I, know, I know Giants fans in New York media likes to crap on Eli Manning a lot. And, and trust me, as a Patriots fan who's lost to them twice in the Super Bowl, it warms my heart. I'm, I'm not going to lie. But I'm looking at this receiving core, and I'll just name off all the – I won't give you stats. I'll just name off the receiving core. Giants fans, I realize who you'll know who this are. But for those of you who are listening who play fantasy football, tell me how many of these names you go, oh, I know that guy. Benny Fowler, Evan Ingram, TJ Jones, Cody Latimer, Cody Core, Saquon Barkley, Russell Shepard, Rhett Ellison, and Wayne Gallman. Like, I'm sorry, there's maybe one or two names on that list that I'll go, yeah, I might pick them up in fantasy. Obviously, Saquon is one, duh. But outside that, I ain't got a lot of faith in them. You got Eli playing, trying to play with, you know, his, the offensive line is what it is. Whether it's, I mean, it's been better. It's, it's be, been it's better. better. It's, it's played, played well better. against it's Buffalo. Played better. Yeah. But this is like this is like trying to s- stick Eli in. The, they're sticking Eli in there without two of his his receiving targets. I mean, it's, and saying win the Super Bowl, kid. You can't pass, but you can run. It's crazy because I would think, all right, week three, you know, you stick with Eli going into a tough team like Tampa Bay. Yeah. You play Eli that week, and then week four. You go in, and you know what? Maybe that's when you pull the trigger. And if not then, when Sterling Shepard would come back from his concussion, then week five would be the week when Golden Tate is back and able to play. So at least that way he has a veteran wide receiver because right now Daniel Jones, and I love it, one of my friends that I'm friends with and we're uh, in a Giants uh, group on Facebook, he replied back and he goes, uh, I go, he goes, oh, well, Daniel Jones is going to be used to throwing these guys. And I'm like, yeah. That's great. They performed well in the preseason against other twos. Yeah. Now they're going to be playing ones. Yeah, yeah. playing the elites of the elites. And right he now. goes, yeah. at least they're going to have their timing down. And I reply back and I go, well, that's the optimistic way to look at it because they're going to get killed. It's like you said, Daniel Jones is going into the Lions' den with the, that Tampa Bay defense, who's got Indomitian and Sue on this team. And I'm sorry, as good as Daniel Jones might have looked in in preseason, against, especially against that Week One game against the Jets and their second team, <laughs> and the entire time the second team, mind you, you know. Joe Smith on, you know, whatever team's third string offense or defense, excuse me, is not in Dominican Sue. Like, no disrespect to anybody that he played against in that Daniel Jones played against in the preseason. They're not in Dominican Sue or the or the Pro Bowl guys that Tampa Bay has. And again, I just this is the things that I don't understand that the organization's doing. If the move was clearly to get Daniel Jones in, and especially given the fact that you're getting him in at week three, Eli Manning is being paid seventeen million dollars now to hold a clipboard mm-hmm. for the entire year. It's an expensive and clipboard. He still has another year on his contract. So what are you like what is the decision processing going on right now? Like what are what is Gettleman doing that you know he sees all right, we know what we're going to pay Eli to be the veteran backup because at least when this flash rewind now 16 years ago when Kurt Warner was the starting quarterback and Eli was on the yeah. uh, you know the secondary quarterback yeah. Kurt Warner was not getting paid seventeen million to be the no, starter. No. He was probably getting paid like three to five. Yeah, and Eli was there waiting in the wings to take over. This it just it makes little to no sense to me that you make the jump when you do because now you have Eli sitting there and God forbid he play. I mean, listen, I am a Giants fan through and through. I love this team. I want nothing more for Daniel Jones to be successful. But let's just play devil's advocate here. God forbid he plays terrible. Mm-hmm. And you go back to Eli, Gettleman and Schumer out. You're gone. Yeah. Like you cannot save face with this. This is not Ben McAdoo going like, you know what? We're just going to get Geno Smith in because we want to give a different look for our offense. Not the same situation. This is you saying Eli's done. We're going with the future. And if he plays bad, and I don't care. I do not care if it's he plays bad, and it's like. 
oh, you know what, the defense lost the game. No, no, no. If he plays bad and they lose games and they go 0-16 and you're sitting there with the number one or number two pick, you know, given that they got to play Miami, so I'm just saying, if they lose to Miami and they go 0-16, which is a real possibility for this team, this team's defense is terrible. Mm-hmm. Miami's yeah. is awful. Yeah, They're terrible. They go in, they lose to Miami, they're 0-16, you got two looking you in the face at one. And Daniel Jones played the way he did. And you draft a quarterback with the first pick in back-to-back years. You look dumber than Detroit when they pick three wide receivers in a row at number four or five and six. I don't. I mean, I'm serious. And I understand the move. Like, I'm not trying to sit here and say, like, oh, you know, Eli should be the star because he's played bad. These losses are not his fault. No. But he has not looked good while they've done it. That game against Buffalo, they had two passing yards the first half. Mm-hmm. Two. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. mean, <laughs> one completion to Evan Ingram, and that was a wrap. So, it, listen, but the defense is bad, and they have gaping holes there. But if you're sitting here and Daniel Jones comes out and he goes, you know, 17 of 40 with three interceptions, and you pull the plug, you know, week six, week seven, and go back to Eli, that's it. You're out. Schumer and Gettleman, you got to go. The experiment's over. It's a wrap. Right. I, th- I think what they need to do, and obviously this is hindsight 2020, they're not doing it now, they should have waited to, to bench Eli because it's like we said, he's playing without his two top wide receivers. So essentially it's like telling Usain Bolt, the fastest man in the world, here, try and break your Olympic world record in a worn down pair of Chuck Taylors that are 30 years old instead of the real nice running shoes that you wore and you won in, within the Olympics. You know, that'd be because let's be honest. That's what it is. Eli's trying to play with these guys who, yes, they're good. Yes, they're good enough to be on an NFL team. Great. Congratulations. You're not their starting wide receivers. Pat, Pat give me what was Saquon's stats for this game? Uh, Saquon's stats, 18 carries for 107 yards, 5.9 uh, average yards, one touchdown. Receiving uh, was three catches for 28 yards, 9.3 uh, yards average, no touchdowns. So that's 21 touches for yeah. Saquon Barkley. 21, uh-huh. which was more than last week, but 21 touches only? Yep. And how many of them were in that first drive? And how many were in the second half? Yeah. Because yeah. not many. I'll tell you, because he disappeared again. And it's certainly not anything of his own fault. That's just play calling. I got a couple of different takes on this one. One, I agree with you. I think this is a very bad mistake for the Giants. Putting in Daniel Jones looks like a panic move right now. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Fully. And obviously going to the Giants webpage right now, Giants.com, I'm looking at, I mean, they're trying to sell it too. I mean, they got a link up for watch every Daniel Jones completion from the preseason. I mean, my God, I go Those on check downs though. <laughs> I go on Facebook today after they named him the starter. And the first thing on Giants, on their Giants Facebook was his preseason stats. And I damn near fell out of my work chair. I couldn't believe it. How are you going to post the man's preseason stats and boast about it? Yeah. That's that's the thing. This is just a bad PR move. I don't understand it's, why it, the pressure is there per se. Because Eli has played badly, but has he played that atrociously that you need to pull him? No, because week one was a loss because the defense couldn't stop exactly. Dallas, period. Right. I mean, but you've already got the New York media calling for Daniel Jones, and obviously I know. they're getting what they want now. Listen, the front page of the New York Daily News, not the back page where you always see the sports stuff, the front page read with a picture of Daniel Jones, give him the bleep ball. That's, that's the problem. They listen to the media, so now the media is going to have a field day with this. And yeah. This kid, I don't think, is ready, to be honest no, with you. I, no. The whole deal was when we were starting the season, all we were hearing was Dan Jones wasn't going to play it down this season. Or, and then, or if he did, it would be late in games, you know, garbage, garbage, garbage time. Yeah. And then obviously. Or, he, or by the bye week, which is what I said. I said by the bye week, he'd pr- he could be in. Yeah. By week, yeah. By week eight would have made a lot of sense. Or. That is when their bye week is. Uh, no, yeah. their bye week's in week 11. Week, week yeah, 11. yeah, week 11. Okay, sorry, I'm looking at their home schedule here. So what I'm saying with this, though, is Daniel Jones should not be playing this early by no. any stretch of the means. Your offensive coordinators play calling for the first half of that game when you ran the ball successfully yeah. and then you went away from it for your next three drives is mind-boggling. I, it's something that I don't least. understand. It's something I don't understand. Because if you're running the ball down your opponent's throats, and you're burning up time on the clock. 
your defense is having enough time to recoup, and like Coach has said, and we have agreed with him, I don't think this is a bad point, your defense for the New York Giants is bad. Your best defense is your mildly. offense. Yes. <laughs> so obviously keeping them on the field as uh, for the duration of time is not going to win you games. Yeah, it shouldn't be no. running tempo. No, you, you know, like that's the fact that that's what they're. You know, Schumer. The, so Schumer came out today and said that you know he felt like the offensive play calling has been limited because they're not able to run RPOs, and that's been such a mainstay in the NFL today. Somebody came back to that and said, "Look at the number of passers, you know, quarterbacks that are true pocket passers that are still elite in the NFL today. There's a lot of them." Yeah. And, you know, you had one. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, his performance has slipped, but if you're trying to sell me on the fu- the fact that now you're going to be able to run RPOs, come on. Yeah. Come on. It's not, it doesn't make any sense. And this is just a, a pure panic move. Because, I mean, listen, look at this is what they have coming up after this. It ain't so pretty. They got Tampa Bay. Mm-hmm. Then they got the Redskins. At home. At home, which, okay, you know, they could win that game. Give me a quarter. Yeah, I mean, they could win that game. Uh, then they got the Vikings and that defense. Yeah. Godspeed. Then they've got the Patriots at Foxborough. At Foxborough yes. On a Thursday night on a short week. Forget about uh-huh. it. When you know, what does Bill Belichick do best? Prepare for rookie quarterbacks. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Eats them for breakfast. Eats he's them have a field alive. Day. I don't have the stat in front of me, but I want to say if he's not undefeated against rookie quarterbacks, he's got maybe one loss. I'll tell you right now that if they, they will have a performance at least. Because they're going to limit Swake, they're going to take Saquon Barkley away. Oh, That's yeah. going to be what they're going to target. Yeah. So they're going to have under 150 yards of total offense that game. And under for, 150. And for a yeah. rookie quarterback with his confidence, if he starts out slow on out the gate, and then he winds up going against the Patriots, and they shut him down, and then the Giants decide to go back to Eli, you can't. That's what I'm saying. You're you fully can't. you're fully in on, on Daniel Jones. Because after that, then you've got Arizona, which, you know, that defense is whatever. Then the Lions, okay. Then you got the Cowboys again. And that defense that played very well against the Giants. So I saw that show once. Yeah, so they literally, by the time that they played the Jets, you know, a uh, week, what would that be, nine, ten? ten. ten. They could, that could be the move back to Eli. And that would be a disaster. You can't go back. You can't. You've no. now go, you've now gone all in, and if this move backfires, which that's I, why it's I'm like fearing, why do it right now? It yeah, did, because they panicked. Because this team panicked. I hate saying this, but it is a panic move on all fronts. The fact that it appears to me, and I'm not a fan of the Giants. I'm not hating on the Giants. Sure, I'm an observer from the outside looking in. This is saying to me the organization doesn't know what the hell they're doing. No. On any level. Facts. On any level. The only thing that I appreciate this does is it saves Eli from Eli. Because he just doesn't have it anymore. He is a serviceable quarterback. No, but Father Time got him. Father Time got him. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's no... There's no doubt about it because there's a difference between him and what Peyton was doing towards the tail end of his career, mm-hmm. and at least Peyton still had the arm. Yeah, Eli's arm is gone. No, yeah. a couple of those just looked like wobbly passes. He I was mean, throwing, and they were they just I don't know if he was pressing himself or whatever the case was during the game against Buffalo. He did not look right. That one pass that he, I think it was to to and, Latimer, uh, it was like a you know I think it was a post. Yep. Uh, midway through the second quarter, and it just carried away from him. But it was like it was wobbling. It was wobbling. I was like, oh man, that's not a good. Yeah. That was not a good replay. Yeah. For the Giants, they had better hope this works. Otherwise, you have to just clean house at the end of the season. I'm telling you, if this, if this. <laughs> If this goes poorly, you have to. You don't yeah. have a choice but to fire everybody. Yeah, yeah. because everybody. If, if they wind up going 0-6, you think the media has been bad now? Right, because like, the same oh, media oh, that's calling for you know Eli out will be calling for him in. Yeah. Oh, it'll get ugly when you get somewhere in, in week four or five because it's back-to-back home games. And if things aren't going well and, and, and they lose against Tampa and then they say, they, let's just say they lose against Washington at home on in week four, week five you get to Minnesota and they're losing at halftime, that crowd's going to get unruly. I, that, I fear the New England game the most. No, that's what I'm saying. The New England game is going to be the tipping point either yeah. way. Yeah. If Daniel Jones somehow survives and puts up a decent stat line, like let's say, for example, the game is – 28 to 14. Sure. I'll, I'll get or something in that variation where it's it's within two touchdowns. Yeah. If Daniel Jones has a serviceable stat line, 
I don't think it'll be that bad. Here's the other thing with that New England game that just occurred to me. Uh, by that point, the Patriots will have Benjamin Watson back as their tight end, who's suspended right now. Oh, now, they'll be loaded. Now, is he a Gronkowski type? No, but he's just another guy that can right. run down the field and catch. Listen, I'm not going to blame Daniel Jones on losses. Like The fact that people are talking about Eli's record is you know, only a few games over 500 is stupid because at the end of the day, this is a, a, a much of a team sport as there possibly can be. So he controls one third of the game. Yeah. So if Eli, if they lose, it's not Eli's fault. No. And these two losses right now are not Eli's fault. So if Daniel Jones comes out and they lose, I'm not going to blame him. But if he's, let's just say, 22 of 47 with three interceptions, I'm going to blame him. Yeah. You have no choice to. Yeah. For the Giants, this is high risk, high reward. This is rolling the dice on the biggest level because <laughs> your season can go up in smoke. If this does not pan out, I mean, careers could go up in smoke. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if this doesn't pan out, you're going to have to pull in Arizona and start all over again and burn your pick. Don't say that. Hey, I'm just speaking the truth. I know. But let us know what you think. Hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPH. Especially hit us up on our Twitter, at ODParlayHour. Coach Duffy will address you about this situation further, Giants bring, Yeah, bring on the Giants stuff. I'll talk all day. Bring it's on. It's brutal. We'll definitely chat more about it online and on social media, but definitely hit us up because for the Giants, this future is uncertain to say the least. And I got, Pat, I got to say uh, thank you to Ken here for not betting with me uh, after, as we discussed off the air with this Giants-Bills game. We, we failed to do anything, which is a benefit to me. Because I knew I knew that they were going to take the L. I knew the Giants were going to lose. I, yeah. I mean, I would have bet it out of pride. You know, I would have been like, yeah, all right. I would have given the point spread, and they wouldn't have covered, so I would have been screwed. So thank you. I need all the Bills karma I can get. So I am not <laughs> I am not taking advantage of that as much as it, uh, it was low-hanging fruit. For the Bills, the future is bright. For the Giants, not so much. But I can't kick the team while they're down. I just can't do that. I'll just say, hey, uh, slight sh- side note. Shout out to uh, Josh Allen for when the, rep- uh, the reporter asked him, oh, you could have ended up in New York. And Josh Allen goes, I, I am did. in New York. Yeah, that was I am in New York. Good for him. I mean, they're the Kings right now. They got to play the Jets, what, week way they're on the season, right? They got yeah, one more time. They, so let's see. I mean, if they sweep New York, I will anoint them. I will put the crown on their heads myself. Let us know what you think. His definitely up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPH. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey, this is Brian Wolf from Fair City Fire. You are listening to ODPH, the greatest podcast in Binghamton. Woo! Back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH podcast, and it's time to run the ropes. Our wrestling recap here yes. on the ODPH. Oh, we're done with Daniel Jones. Oh, we're done with Daniel Jones right, for right now. Right, but we right. do we do have to give a quick uh, two shout outs to John Cena, who is now following the show. Hey, Ooh. and to Stephanie McMahon, who is now bow, 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 bow. aware of the show. Oh, we, so we wait, don't wait. Know. I'm looking at the follower list. There's nothing there. Well, Stephanie is aware of the show. No, I'm, so. I'm referring to Cena. Well, I, oh, there's a blank spot can't there. See him. There's a blank spot there. Well, so we've been told. So I guess we're just gonna have to go <laughs> yeah. to OD Parlay Hour and see for yourself. Self. But going into the recap, it was a WWE's Clash of Champions pay per view mm-hmm. this weekend. Every championship is on the line. Yeah, which high stakes. It was it, it was high supposed something. to be high stakes, but it just didn't really have any luster for me. I don't know. I went into this pay per view with low expectations, and they were met. I mean, it, <laughs> it, I mean, it's exciting to think that okay, we're not going to have like a WrestleMania type situation where certain belts might get left off the card for God knows what reason. That every belt will be seen in some fashion on the card. But I mean, when you come down to it. There are just some matchups that you look at and go, eh. Yeah, this one just didn't do anything for me. I'm sorry. I just I yeah. I, I, I watched the show. It was a good show overall. Yeah, but it wasn't like a wow moment. Like no. for me, I was more shocked that AJ Styles and Cedric Alexander was on the pre-show. Yeah, which I thought was gonna be like match of the night, possibly. Well, I mean, looking the way the card was laid out, you kind of had to have a feeling that they would open up hot with them. Like I mean, that's just that's this wrestling one hundred and one is right. that hot match that could be the match of a the night. They typically will bump to the pre-show because it will get fans warmed up. Yeah, 
And that's all what they've yeah, always done. Yeah, I mean, AJ is, you know, no matter who he's working with, has shown that he can work well with any competitor you put him up against and get the crowd going. Yeah, I mean, I was, for me, I just thought that, sh- that match should have been later, but that's just me. But, Pat, you got the breakdown of the yep. card. Yeah, so uh, they let off the night with the Cruiserweight Championship, the Triple Threat, where Drew Gulak defeated Humberto Carrillo and Lince Dorado. I heard that was a little bit of a dud. Yeah, kind of a, missed a little bit, which is I, which is odd because the cruiserweights are usually fire, yeah. right? No, it just kind of looked like the timing was off for those guys. Yeah, it just it, it was a good match, but just there's spots that were just kind of like okay, somebody's a little behind on something. Yeah. Uh, then we have the match we mentioned before: AJ Styles defeated Cedric Alexander to retain the United States Championship. We got all got that right. Yep. 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 Yes, we did. Yep. Uh, go ahead. No, 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 what can you say about that? I mean, I, I thought the match was a little shorter than I thought yeah. it was going to be, but for me, like I said, I went in this thing and this could have been a match of the night. Uh, so as listed by the uh, Times here on the Wikipedia page for Clash of Champions 2019, according to this uh, chart here, second shortest match of the night. Five, Whoa! Four minutes and 55 seconds. That's a miss. Yeah, that's why I said it, it just it felt short. And I guess, like, for me, maybe that's why I'm kind of giving it a low grade. My yeah. God. AJ yeah. Styles only working four minutes. He probably wasn't even. And, and Cedric Alexander, too. Yeah. But neither one of them probably out of breath. Yeah, because they've had such a good feud built up, and I yeah. know they've added War Machine, a.k.a. the Viking experience to the whole... Viking like, Raiders. What, yeah, whatever it is and now. And who's AJ Styles with? Uh, the, the Bullet Club. S- the real Bullet Club. I think they're the OC. Well, okay. Some call them that. You you can say tomato, I say tomato. So <laughs> that's how we kind of leave it at that. Damn it! Pat, next, what's up? After that, you had uh, Robert Roode and Dolph Ziggler defeat Seth Rollins and Braun Strowman to win the WWE Raw Tag Team Champions. Can I show you my surprise face? Yeah, yeah, same here. Yeah, I mean, we we, we, we kind of knew about it. We said about it on the show last week that Braun was going to go beltless. Yeah, and obviously this is what started it. I Ziggler and Rude just are not doing anything for me as a team. It's not like no. when they put Billy Gunn and and Road Dog together and then they had the chemistry there. This one is just they're it, thrown it, together. I'm happy that Root is getting screen time. Yeah, too. no, I'm I'm glad to see Robert Root on TV. You know, but to me, this is a house show tag team where we just need to make a tag team matchup. We don't really have anybody available. Let's do this. You know, they're both very good competitors as singles oh, as singles matches. But there's nothing that I'm looking at going. These guys are great tag team, a great tag team. They got great chemistry and moves that really work well with each other. Like I'm just not seeing that. Yeah, and I normally love the two guys feuding going into the tag title run. Yeah, too though with the Seth and the Braun thing, like that's always fun. But then when you just have them drop the title to yeah. not a tag team, yeah, that I, was just put together the same way they were. It's mm-hmm. like that doesn't make any sense. No, the, the feud is supposed to be, you know, that oh we don't like each other because we're clashing over the main title, but you know we're facing a tag team that gets along and they're so efficient together. You know, it's right. like that's and, the spot the revival should have been in. Right, I agree. Right, and now. Now they're, we'll get to the Raw in a minute, but now they're running vignettes on Raw with Authors of Pain coming back and basically saying, if you don't give us what we deserve, we'll take what we deserve. And, and I'm sorry, as good as Robert Roode and Dolph Ziggler are, AOP's going to run through them. Oh, I can't wait for AOP to get back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll get into that a little later. Yes. After that, you had the SmackDown Women's Championship where Bailey retained her uh, championship against Charlotte Flair in the shortest match of the night, three minutes and 45 seconds. But I was okay with this yeah, because heel Bailey is great. Oh, my heel God. Heel Bailey is fantastic. Oh, my God. The yakety sacks uh, run out of the ring. Yeah. Oh, my God. Amazing. You can find that clip on uh, Twitter, I'm sure. I'm just, I need her to get new theme music and yeah. get rid of the stupid inflatable uh Ba- uh, the wacky, wavy, and fun. Yeah, the hell they are. I'm still for it. I still like it. <sighs> okay, but you're entitled to your opinion. We don't have say, to it's a, it's a, You know what? It's a slow turn, though. You know, first she changed the color of her clothing, and now the little star she's got uh, drawn on her above her one eye. But that's I turned black. I love the I don't give an F what I've done. I'm still me. You know, he'll move. Like, that's fun. Yeah, yeah. That's what I see Bailey being, you know? Like, what I'm doing is bad, but. Do I really care? No, you know. And she finally has like developed some charisma that this is getting over. Like for me, when she came up, she was just so much of a baby face, right? That it was just like, all right, it, I'm happy kinda, to be here. Yeah, it's kind of like the same way like Cena was, you know, where everybody just wanted him to go heel so much. Yeah, and yeah. To see Bailey just really freshen up that character, I think is great because I think she's one of the best women wrestlers. Yeah, actually, she's one of the best wrestlers. Period. On I that mean, roster. the yeah. ultimate heel move would be to push the Bailey girl in the face, but then she knows jujitsu now, so she might. Yeah. Mess yeah. Yeah, you want no part of that. No. No part of that smoke. No. Uh, after that, you had the Revival defeat the New Day to win the SmackDown Tag Team Championship. Nailed it. 
We yeah. all got that right. Yeah, this one made complete sense. I know there were some people online that were mad about this, but it was like, no, this makes complete sense. Yeah. Perfect sense. Yeah. What else can you say about that? Uh, after that, you had uh, Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross retain the WWE Women's Tag Team Championship against Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville. I got that one wrong. I had this right, but I will tell you, or actually, I am not sure. I can't remember. No, this one no, no, I had, I. But I, I, will say, I will say this, though. Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville impressed me. Like, yeah. this is the first yeah. time I've seen them wrestle together as a team that they really looked like a team, and especially that finisher they have. Yeah. Right, where Mandy Rose is given one of the best V trigger knees in the business right now. Ow. Yeah, like, that was a perfect way to finish. But I do like the team of Nikki and Alexis, so I'm yeah. happy they stuck together because I think this, I th- thought they were going to break up with losing the belts. Yeah. But they're retained, so I'm, I'm cool with that. No, yeah, I'm, I'm glad Nikki and Alexa retained the belts because, I mean, we've said it before, They if, if they want to make the Women's Tag Team Championship a thing, you need to build some teams. You've got one with Fire and Desire, as they're called, you know, so Mandy uh, Rose and Sonya Deville. You know, it's just a good way to build the titles up and then also build your division up. Absolutely, so I'll take that any day. Yeah, and then after that, you had uh, Shinsuke Nakamura with Sami Zayn uh, defeat The Miz for the Intercontinental Championship. I think we all had that one. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just please That don't. should have been on the pre-show. I mean, Yeah, I agree. Yeah, you know, just in future, if you're going to continue having Sami Zayn with Nakamura at ringside, I'm fine with that. That's fine. Just don't give him a, a live mic while he's in the middle of wrestling. You bite your tongue. Give Sammy the mic all I, day and I, let him go. I think it's funny when they've done that before. And I mean, Sammy's not the first to do that. No, they've done it before. Yeah, but, they had Leo Rush do that yeah, with Lashley. Yeah. But, well, but, Leo Rush doesn't work, but I no, like, yeah. But, but, but Sammy Zayn works on the mic, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Heal Sammy on the mic and just being heel Sammy, yeah. I'll take it every day. The pairing with him and Knock, though, I'm not quite settled in on yet. I'm getting there. I'm, I'm getting there, but I, I do like it that those guys are finally getting what seems like a good push now. Mm-hmm. Right. So I'll take that. Yeah. After that, you had uh, Sasha Banks defeat Becky Lynch by disqualification. So there you go. Uh, Becky Lynch did not lose her Raw Women's Championship in the second longest match of the night at 20 minutes. Now, I tweeted this out that I said, okay, Becky was going to somehow retain, and then they're going to have the big rematch at Hell in a Cell. Okay. Inside the Cell. Yeah. I am happy they're doing this. Yeah. I hated it. The ending to this match, yeah, like it just kind of because it wasn't it just like they kept going and going and going and going and it's almost like the the announcers forgot what the ending was supposed to be and they're just like oh hey yeah by the way because this happened here's the ending I mean I, we kind of had a feeling that it wasn't going to be a clean finish you yeah know, it was going to be no. some sort of schmaz so. like I thought Becky or Bailey was going to come in and and you know help Sasha win the belt yeah yeah I mean I we all thought it was going to be some sort of schmuck so not being clean makes sense now yeah. you get them in yeah. the cell yeah which I think will be epic oh I think the two amazing. of them amazing I mean given the fact we and we've this is well documented Sasha is willing to go there yeah you know you'll probably see something crazy out of her in this you know hell in the cell match I just hope whoever the referee was in this match is okay because he took that shot and was down for like a year <laughs> my, you gotta sell it my goodness that was a devastating chair shot yes after that you had uh, Kofi Kingston defeat Randy Orton to retain the WWE championship in the longest match of the night at 20 minutes and 50 seconds and continuing their feud tonight yeah uh a couple thoughts on this. I was happy to see Kofi win clean. Yeah. I thought we were going to see some revival New Day hijinks. And to see him get the clean win, and it was a good match. I mean, pacing was kind of long. Yeah. And as you touched upon, it was the longest match of the night. I That was kind of the only drawback because I, I thought it was a good match. I didn't think it was great. Yeah. I mean, my problem is just that Randy Orton's so in his way. Yeah. You know, that you're not going to see anything – deviate from the Randy Orton right. game plan. You're, you're, you not know? Gonna, you're not going to see a move he rarely breaks out and go, oh my gosh, I haven't seen that in a while. Yeah. Right, exactly. So, I mean, you're getting what you're getting. You, you, can, you, almost, you can almost run down like an itinerary checklist of like oh, things. Oh, for sure. Like, all right, there's the uh, the hanging DDT. All right, there's the RKO. There's the backbreaker. There's the backbreaker. Yep. There's, the backbreaker. Yep. there's the attempted punt. And the hand stomps. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like Seamus was for a while. It's just yeah. you have the checklist and you know that those sets are coming. So, yep. And I don't want to crap on him because, I mean, he's a great performer and everything. It's just, for me, I I, I would rather see Kofi move away, start something new, get some fresh blood, because right now Kofi Mania is dwindling, and it's yeah. not helping being yeah. in with Randy Orton. No, no, because it's all wash, rinse, repeat yeah. with Randy. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's why the match was so bad. I, I, we were talking with Pina Comics on there. Shout out to them. And I think everybody's kind of in agreement with it. It was just like... 
it was okay, but it was a snooze fest for the most yeah. part. I mean, let's right. be honest. But it was a good match. But I think you're expecting more out of those guys because of who they are. Sure. Yeah. And, sure. and for Kofi, I'm hoping Hell in a Cell is the final match with those two. And I'm hoping that maybe since now the New la, Day la, doesn't la, have la, the titles. La, 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 la. I don't want to hear it. Okay. I'll save you my my prediction. No, no I don't no, want to hear that. No. You, I know you're gonna say New Day breaks up. I don't want to know. I don't yeah. want it. I don't want it to happen. I love the New Day. I, I'm calling it right now. Big E's gonna go. It's time. It's time. No belts. No problem. Let's make it happen. No belts. No problems. Okay. Uh, coin that one. Hashtag yes. Uh, after that, you had Eric Rowan defeat Roman Reigns in a no disqualification match, <laughs> but that's not even the big oh, story of oh. this match. Luke Harper sighting. <laughs> yeah. Out of nowhere, literally. literally. Hey, okay. Good to see Luke. No, that was the only highlight for me of this match. Yeah, I'm sorry. Like, I don't care about the whole who hit Roman storyline. I don't. Uh, it wasn't even a highlight to me because he's put into this garbage. Yeah, yeah. like <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. I just I, I also wasn't very impressed with the match because hey, great to see Luke Harper back. You know, hopefully they can do something with him and make him look look good. But. In a no disqualification match, I should expect to be seeing some stuff that makes me feel slightly uncomfortable with, oh, my God, I can't believe they're doing that. But there was none of that. And especially you're trying to push Roman is at that level. Yeah. yeah. Like, he's got, I, he's got, that, he's got yeah. that extra gear. That's what makes him dominant. Yeah, like, the only way I'm seeing this kind of come to some any fruition is Debray is was, actually the real mastermind and is reunited oh, with Legend s- Brothers. And this it was me all along. Yeah, see, I was going to go the other way. I was going to say face Daniel Bryan shows up and helps him take on the Bludgeon Brothers. See, which I don't want. I don't want. I love heel Daniel Bryan. I got so, to five rough. But I but I fear that that's what they'll do because that's what they do. What if they do this? What if they you still keep D. Bry a heel, but the next pay per view Hell in a Cell, you've got you know Bludgeon Brothers for lack of a better name versus Roman and D. Bry. But D. Bry's still heel, but he's just like listen. We like they start attacking Daniel Bryan in the intervening intervening weeks leading up to Hell in a Cell, which leads Roman to go, hey, listen, you got a problem. I got a problem. Let's take this thing, care of this thing. Wrestling. I, either, yeah, but either way, though, I don't want to see Brian and Roman in the same corner. No, I That's don't. my thing, you know? Like, that's what I want to avoid. Build them for Survivor Series and let that match happen. Okay. That, I'm, just, I'm hoping, but I'm, I'm also fearful with the draft looming that they decided to announce that Raw and SmackDown were having their own respective drafts again. Right. Yeah. Well, with, I think NXT is going to be involved in that draft, yeah, too. Yeah, everybody's so, involved. Three parties, yeah. Yeah, and technically 205 Live because they're getting absorbed in the NXT. Right. Yep. So it's going to get kind of weird, but I agree with Coach. I don't want to see Roman and Brian team up and and yeah. determine the. I love the idea of him end up being, but just the only thing that weirds me out is like obviously Rowan and him had that fallout, so I don't, I just don't see the, like that making sense. Sure. Unless uh, like... from from a wrestling standpoint, oh yeah, they would book that, but to me, like in my mental capabilities of handling things like to me i just they 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 broke up like i don't yeah. see now a whole time i was unless they're saying this? unless they're saying daniel bryan this is the master plan we had to sell it that we really hate each yeah. other but we're really friends and, dumb dumb yeah. but good for luke harper being able to hang low like that yeah you know? i mean you talk about a man that moves in silence like lasagna yes. Un- underutilized this man. highly underutilized highly. most underutilized talent on the roster quite possibly quote me on that yeah uh, after that, you had your main event. Seth Rollins defeated Braun Strowman to retain the Universal Championship. But again, the outcome, not the biggest story of the match. Okay. No, oh, you. I am coming in hot on this I one. I saw that. You clear Uh-oh. the runway. Uh-oh. Braun hits a frog splash. It is game over. Game Drive home safe. over. The, yeah. No, the fact that he, Seth kicked out. No, I'm sorry. I'm done. Like, that done. man weighs 350 pounds, and he Full fledged sailed on top of you. Your yep. ropes are crushed. Done. Yep. D- d- I'm sorry. I I understand wrestling is what wrestling is. Yeah. Done. You're, <laughs> no, you're not telling me otherwise. I'm sorry. Super Seth did not happen. Yo, but good for Seth though, being willing to take that. Hell yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because there's my, not a lot of people who would. Because not, first off, let's just talk about the fact that how often does Braun probably practice doing a frog splash? Not None. Often. And you talk, you know, yeah, you he looked heard, nervous on that top rope too. Yeah, uh-huh. And you hear the stories of like how RVD, you know, and Eddie used to lay in the frog splashes, and guys, you know, got the wind knocked out of them, or Macho Man when he would lay the elbow in. There's not much wiggle room when you land those splashes. No. And you have that looking, like you're looking up at that. Like Seth must have been freaking out oh he i was freaking out at home going 
wait, what the hell is he doing? Because I had two thoughts going through. I said, one, is he going to try a shooting star press because it didn't work out for Brock? And then the second one was like, oh, crap, he's going to hit this on Seth. Yeah. That was literally my thoughts watching this. I'm going, There there was probably like an unagreed round uh, between the two of them going, listen, we pull this off and it works, I'll buy you a round. I mean, because, my God, when he went to that top rope, you saw Braun's face like, I'm going. Yeah, (laughs) because that could have gone very Sid in a real hurry. Real quick. Yeah. Yeah. But that was, like Pat was alluding to, that wasn't the biggest highlight of the, of the night. <laughs> no, uh, after the match was all said and done, Seth standing on the top of the ramp. Well, I won, holding the championship up. The lights cut, sound effects hit, and who's standing there? The Fiend. Love it. Yeah, I love mean, it. we said that that was going to be what happened. And I and I love that they're leaning into this because it got leaked, because I think it was wherever Hell in a Cell is being held. Put yeah, out the, put out the flyer. The flyers, the and, it, and it got leaked out early, and they kind of alluded to it on last week's episode of Raw. I like that they're embracing it, and they're not doing the, well, shucks, you got that, so we're going to give you, oh, no, he's actually facing insert random wrestler at Hell in a Cell, which makes no sense, only for the Fiend to attack said wrestler and take his opportunity away. Like I like they're not going that route, and they're just going, nope, hey, you know what? You know about it. We're doing it. Well, here's, so here's my two things. One, I don't like the fact that Braun lost clean because, mm. I mean, he was finally built back up to the level that you felt like he was a monster again. He lost clean, but he still looked strong because Bra- uh, Braun... Uh, Seth had to hit him with four curb stomps and a pedigree before yeah, but, he lost. But what I mean, still though, that's still clean. You know, I don't care how many times you got hit, quote unquote hit your finisher. If you're getting a one two three on a guy without some sort of schmaz, without some some interference, it's still a clean loss. You know, I mean, and it is what it is. I mean, it's just to me now that knocks Braun down a pedestal, and I love the fiend coming in. I would have, I I think it's smart not doing the fiend Braun and Seth in a. Uh, Hell in the Cell triple threat. So I like the fact that they moved away and went clean with the Fiend. I just, I just really want Braun to be able to be the monster that he's supposed to be. Here's something wild I just realized: in the span of about a half an hour, you had the entire Wyatt family on TV for about within the span of about a half hour. Well, I mean, Wyatt had put that on Twitter and talked yeah. about that. There's so much to talk about with Braun and. He, this is a very highly debated topic. If you know, did he look weak? Or did he look strong coming out of this? I mean, let's talk about the fact that the man got crushed by a car by Roman mm-hmm. in an ambulance. It, it, wasn't he put in the? Uh... And that looked strong, but then still, what happened to him after that? He won a tag team title match at WrestleMania what, with also, somebody out of the crowd. Wasn't he also thrown in the back of like a garbage truck too? Yeah, yeah. He, he's been the un- indestructible force, and now whatever direction they're going with him. I almost want to say this is going to be retconned when they get to the the draft, wherever they're going to send them to. Yeah. That's my feeling. So I thought that they were just going to, hey, we're going to push over Seth and really make him look good. I didn't really feel that Braun looked bad, but then again, I'm like, he hit him with a freaking frog splash from the right. top rope. Game <laughs> over. I don't care what anybody says. Right. Braun, Braun's fine, right. in my opinion. You know, the, the Braun's been at the proverbial summit of the mountain however many times he just can't get to the peak of the mountain. Like, what more has the man got to do? Right, and well, now that you keep having him lose and lose the way that he is, that doesn't help the monster, you know, it is. When Brock loses, how did Brock lose? Oh. A million chair shots, mm-hmm. yeah. a, a shot to the, you know, Bungaza area. I'll say what, Cena was only able to ever beat him the one time years ago with, like, a... a Steel chain. Yeah, but still yeah. something, you know. I mean, so Braun keeps getting beat, but it keeps getting beat by finishers with nothing else in in, in yeah. addition. Yeah. Like I said, I think for this time, though, I agree with you on that stance, but I think for this time they're just waiting to get through the draft and sure. see where he lands up. Yeah, yeah. Because it, let's say hypothetically he winds up going to NXT and being the big fish down oh there. Could you? God. Oh, my God. That'd be Yeah, nuts. him versus the entire Undisputed Era. Him versus Keith Lee. I, I oh, give me that all day. I don't want to see him there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like and. Keep NXT, bring, you know, KO over like the, the rumors are. Fatal, Give me that. Fatal four-way. Him versus Keith Lee versus Cassius Ono versus Pete Dunne. There'll be a lot of hard-hitting in that. I don't uh-huh. Know. I don't, Real know I, I don't think Braun's ready for Pete Dunne, to be uh, honest I don't, with I don't you. Think, I don't think I don't he's think ready it. for that kind of style. Give me Pete Dunne versus Nakamura. Oh, That's my match I want to oh. see. You stop that. And then cringe. Because it's going to be violent <laughs> as all blazes. Uh-huh. But going into this week, though, NXT is coming to... USA on Wednesday, the yep. this kickoff on their national te- television debut. Yep. Going into this week, though, Raw did kick off, though. So yes. we have three shows that are going to be happening this week. Overall thoughts on Raw this week, because I thought it was a letdown, in my opinion. A little bit of a letdown. I mean, I get I get that they're leaning into The Fiend so much because he's got to be the hottest thing going in WWE right now. But 
you almost got to be careful with it because it's might be coming too much of a good thing. Yeah, I mean, they are running into the position where it's so hot that, you yeah. know, he's getting over as a face instead of a heel right now. And, yeah. You know, obviously, they have to be careful with how they book baby faces because, you know, when you over push them like they are with Seth and stuff, then when the heel comes up, you know, they're instantly, you know, he's taking out the good guy situation, right. so mm. he's instantly over. Right. So, yeah, I think too much of a good thing is a is – a problem, and I think also, you know, they're going to kind of be coasting the next couple of weeks because they're getting ready for the draft. Yeah. So I don't think we're really going to see much until those shows, you know, the draft shows. Come right. Out. And we should note it is a full fledged draft like they did years ago when they first did the brand split. It's not a superstar shakeup where you're sitting there watching Raw or SmackDown and going, "Oh no, look who's here!" It, no, it's a full fledged draft. Yeah. Fox is talking about dedicating an entire like pre show draft show yeah like a whole like they're going to be hosting a draft show i can see that they're all in on this and like i said for raw to kick off this week because it's going to cap off with nxt yep raw needed a strong show to start it really I don't, wasn't it, it really didn't happen no. I, I don't even want to get into the whole mike canellis angle because i Ooh. i i was if we were going to talk about that i was going to say my piece on it is i hate when they bring real life stuff into storylines yep to the point where it gets uncomfortable for the viewer, yeah. Which exactly what that was, and I know yeah. the attitude era we used to thrive on that, but that's not the same thing because this is literally these two people's lives, and it's just mm. uncomfortable. Yeah, I, it, I was very uncomfortable. Watching like the it as Seth well. Becky stuff, yeah. got awkward. That was this. It's it's when the line crosses to reality from too far. Entertainment. It's just and too, it, it's yeah, just too, you it's can't too, bring it back. Far. And then especially, too, it's it's like you knew when everybody you saw in the locker room, you knew Ricochet was probably going to get the match because he's the only one they featured on TV. Right. Yeah. They already tipped their hat to us. I mean, that's why he was there and amongst then, other people in the locker and room. And that's how you bring back Rusev. Yeah. After and, months of like him being like, I'm not, you know, whatever, I'm an independent contractor and all that stuff on Twitter. Yeah. And this is how you bring back the Who, guy. Which, by the way, he looked like a cruiserweight. Oh, how my much weight he lost. Ugh. Oh, my I Lord. just, I mean, I couldn't get over the mustache. Yeah. Yeah. The mustache was epic. <laughs> The mustache was epic. No Lana, no real explanation, except I think she was at, what, Fashion Week? Yeah, she's yeah, over, she was she was over in New York. Yeah. Oh, in London? Okay. Yeah, yeah, London. And then they also had AOP come back. So, I mean, there was a lot of t people coming back to the show. So, they obviously, going into the draft and going into NXT's debut this week, they really want to load up each show. Yeah, sure. I think tonight, as we're recording, we're going to see some more faces reappear on Probably. SmackDown. And then definitely going to NXT you're going to see Kevin Owens on that show. Guarantee you. I don't know if it'll be this week or if it's going to be the draft week show. I think it's going to be this week because they want to have that rating spike. Yeah. Okay. And I think you're going to see you're going to see is, a big star. So is it on USA tomorrow? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yes. It starts tomorrow as we're recording. So AEW's tomorrow? No. no. Oh, AEW's they did a week ahead? Two weeks two ahead. Weeks ahead. Oh, those sly dogs. Yeah. yeah. That, the WWE, you dogs. Yeah. Right. So there's going to be so much going on. And like I said, to come off a week raw, in my opinion, though, is not the best look, but they're going to finish strong with NXT. Sure. sure. Mark my words. That is going to be the show you want to watch this week. Yeah. So get your recording set. Get everything ready because it's going to be on network TV, on USA Network, wherever you're watching that station. Make sure to check it out this week. And also make sure to check out 3FNW, our friends over at 3Fat Nerds. They do a wrestling podcast that will be coming out this Thursday night, so you'll be able to hear all the recap of all three shows happening on the WWE Network and WWE programming. But definitely hit us up and let us know what you think. Hashtag ODPH, what is your take on all the wrestling action this week? We definitely want to know. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Two, three, four. Hey, this is Johnny Moose from Excite Wrestling, and you're listening to the OD. P.H. I didn't mess it up. I thought I would. Right now, back to the guys. Coming back for the final segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast. Pad, you got anything for the local minute? Uh, not too much. Just getting closer and closer to opening day for the uh, Binghamton Devils. Fair enough. That's going to be kicking off in a couple weeks as we are going to be at New York Comic Con when the home opener is happening. But for more information on that, BinghamtonDevils.com. And it's almost Bulldog Season 2, so shout out to our boys over there playing some basketball for the ABA. BinghamtonBulldogs.com for more information on that. Yes. So let's get to rounding those bases, shall we? Pad, kick us off. Sure. Got a little interesting thing. As uh, the Boston Red Sox are getting ready to play tonight, I believe they're playing the San Francisco Giants. Uh, Mike Yastrzemski is going to be starting in left field tonight at a Fenway Park. If the last name sounds familiar, that is because, yes, he's the grandson of Carl Yastrzemski, who played there for 23 years. And you know what? Sometimes baseball's just that cool. 
Yeah, that's a very cool thing to see. I mean, obviously, I mean, how many years is the difference? Uh, it, it's about well, Carl Yastrzemski played there for twenty three years, so his grandson is going to be playing there tonight. So just a little fun. Hey, a couple generations. Yeah, I was going to say it's, it's a couple generations easy yeah. right there. So, but you know, baseball is a time honored tradition, so gotta yeah. go with that. Yeah, and of course, speaking of baseball, we are just less than two weeks away from the season. So just a quick standings update: uh, the Yankees are in first place with the American League East, three games away from uh, winning the American League East. The Minnesota Twins are in first place, eight games away from winning their division in the American League Central. The Houston Astros are in first with four games away from winning the American League West. Flipping to the National League, uh, the Atlanta Braves have already clinched uh, a playoff berth in the uh, National League East. They are three games away from clinching the division. St. Louis is uh, 11 games away from clinching the National League Central. And then the uh, Atlanta Dodgers have already clinched the National League West. Baseball is getting rear that postseason, uh-huh. getting ready to really kick that into high gear. Yes. The Yankees are in first place. That's all we need to worry about. Yes. Coach, what do you have for our bases? I Well, I'm going to hit a double today, okay. and I got two. I got my first one I'm going to lead with the uh, Premier Lacrosse League. We're going to talk some lacrosse. Uh, has their first ch- uh, championship game on NBC. Ooh, NBC, folks. Big time. Lacrosse is going to be played on a main channel that you do not need cable for. No. For the first time in a billion years. Yes. Uh, you have your Redwoods versus the Whip Snakes in a classic two versus four matchup that's going down at two thirty on Saturday. Uh, and then for the first round pick, because what they did for their playoffs was one played two, three played four. The okay. losers of that moved on to the next round. The winner of the first matchup got an automatic buy to the championship. And then the bottom seeds played for the first pick overall in the draft. Huh. So added a little incentive for that first pick. The Atlas are playing the Archers at 1130 on NBC Sports Gold. If you have a subscription for that, you know that will be on there. But again, the main, uh, main card, 230, NBC. Get ready for that. on the network. Yeah, yeah that's a excited. huge move. Huge let's, move. Let's go Redwood. And then the nightcap, the Peter Resistance. We have Notre Dame traveling to Georgia, to Athens, to play the Bulldogs on CBS. CBS, mind you, can only air so many games at night due to their contract with college football. Sure. They bumped Alabama and Auburn. You're out of there. Wow. You're not getting the nightcap. Notre Dame's that important. Notre Dame, Georgia, three versus seven. Georgia's got a lot on the line here, obviously. Talked a lot of smack when Notre Dame abruptly didn't show up against that game against Clemson. Mind you, they lost at a lower point total than what Alabama lost to Clemson to. We don't need to go into that, but obviously Georgia fans were chirping that they should have been in the the playoff scene after their performance against Alabama, so it's a big road test. Obviously, you know where my heart lies, so if you got nothing going on, that's there for you. There you go. Big game for the Irish, so definitely stay tuned for that. I know Coach will have the recap of that next week. I mean, I will be watching on pins and needles. <laughs> yes, so definitely hit him up on Twitter during the game if you want to give your instant reactions. I may not answer, though, because I might smash my phone. Yeah. So, there. But at least I'll get there, so I mean, that's what matters. We'll, <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll have Coach's link up on our ODPH Twitter page later today, so definitely interact with him on that. So for my bases, to quickly round out the show before we get into locks and leaps, UFC action this past weekend, huge Mm-hmm. Fight happened in the yep. lightweight division. We've Big been deal. waiting on. Yeah. It finally happened. Nobody got hurt. See, this is what happens when the dream fights happen and they actually go through because yeah. we got our money's worth. Yeah. Even though it was a free card on ESPN Plus. Yeah. Fight night happened. Justin Gaethje versus Donald Cowboy Cerrone. Yep. And Pad, how was that result? Uh, Justin Gaethje defeated Donald Cowboy Cerrone in the first round with a knockout in punches. This is what you wanted to see as an MMA fan. Yeah. I was excited about this. And Gaethje, I mean, I tell you what, he looked impressive. Now the question for him moving forward is, what's next? Mm-hmm. So, Pad, let me ask you this. Uh-huh. Who do you think he fights next? I mean, I like the the names he threw out at the end of the fight when uh, Joe Rogan was interviewing him. Would, he, I, if I'm not mistaken, it was the winner of uh, Tony and Khabib. That's one possibility. I heard another. No. Break it down for us. Hey, Mr. McGregor. He's retired. Yes, uh, which I love Gaethje's response that, yes, he did say that Connor was retired in his own way, and he wants that title shot. So let me ask the panel for this. Okay. Who do you think he should fight? 
Well, I think I think the stars line up perfectly with Diaz now being booked. I think that this fits right where McGregor's time frame is for returning, which I know he tweeted like December 4th. Mm-hmm. So I would think Gaethje's ready to go by then. So I, I think that makes sense. Let the title fight happen with Khabib and Ferguson. Yeah. And then the winner of the McGregor Gaethje goes on to face the winner of uh, Khabib and uh, Ferguson. I say he gets the winner of Khabib and Ferguson. Like, Connor, outright. Con, outright. Connor fight can wait down the road. It's been how long since he's been in a fight? You mm-hmm. know, hasn't done anything, hasn't won anything. Uh, granted, also hasn't lost anything. But still, <laughs> you've done nothing to improve your stock in, in, in the rankings, as it were, you know, for me. So, Connor, yeah, you can get the fight down the road. But outright, give Gaethje the winner of uh, Khabib and Tony. For me... Gaethje should fight the winner of Habib and Tony. That makes the most sense to me. The counter fight is appealing for the sheer factor of there is a history there between those two. A little bit. Gaethje will engage him in the trash talk. A little bit. But Connor fighting Gaethje, I think, will be a short night for Connor. Mm-hmm. And if that happens, the mystique of Connor, Mystic Mac, is gone. Yep. Gaethje will finish him early. My bold. ODPH prediction. Bite your tongue. The, the way too early Speak prediction. of the king. The king will get dethroned like he was on Game of Thrones. This will be bloody. It just, will I will say just hopefully in a nicer manner. I'm telling you, Gaethje is no joke, and especially disposing of Cerrone like he did. With Cerrone, is still no slouch. No. Obviously, the title hopes, I think, are out the window for him yeah, at this stage. Yeah, Unless he wanted to drop to 145 and try making a run there. but yeah. I, Unless he starts going on like a, a Walt Disney movie type of run. Yeah, I don't see a, yeah, a title I mean, on his future. I mean, he's looked good, but it just Gaethje just derailed him. So unless there was a massive injury bug that bit the UFC, and I'm not wishing that by any means. No. No, I, I think the window for a belt is closed for Cerrone, but Cerrone can still definitely throw with the best of them. So he's still got a couple fights left in him. And for Gaethje, like I said, the fight that makes the most sense is the winner to get his title shot at the lightweight title. Yeah. If you want to fight McGregor, like I said, I think I think he wins outright, and I think he wins very decisively too. Yeah. Hey. Also, shout out to Misha Serkinov who was on the main card for ESPN uh, using the ever ever el- uh, elusive Peruvian necktie. Submission. Yeah, which was insane. Never seen that one before. I've seen it happen once before, and to pull that it's off, rare. that's high-level jujitsu. Uh-huh. That is not something you do every day. No. There is a UFC card this weekend, though. Yes. Yair Rodriguez versus Jeremy Stevens is another fight night. Uh-huh. This one, for me, i got to take Jeremy Stevens. Yeah. Yair Rodriguez had the fluke knockout of the Korean zombie, which yeah. if you have not seen that finish. Yeah. That was a battle through and through between both uh-huh. those two guys. Yeah. But he landed the wildest elbow, Hail Mary punch, yeah. strike, whatever you, want to, dark. whatever you want to call it. He nailed that on the zombie and just dropped him. Yeah. I don't think he's going to do that, Stevens. No. Stevens is no joke. Stevens can definitely hang with anybody at 145. He's always been a perennial contender, but just hasn't gotten over the hump there to get the title shot. But this one, I think he wins outright. Yeah. Definitely do. Yeah. And to cap off the night of fights, though. There was some boxing action uh-huh. that Tyson Fury won his match. And dare I say... That was messy. It was messy, him against Wallen. Literally. He had a gash, coach, opened over his eye. Wow. That, like early in the fight, too, that right? That took, like, double-digit stitches to close. Oh, early. boy. Right, wasn't Almost. it? Wasn't it? Like, it wasn't first round, but, it like, in terms of, like... First third, middle third, latter third. It was like in the kind of later, early part of the of the match. Yeah, it was early, to say the least. It was it was not pretty. Yeah, he was bleeding outright, and I I think oh. he t- I think he took the fight a little too lightly yeah, maybe. going into it. Maybe, but he turned it on late to win the decision. Man, sometimes that's all you need is that double stitch over the eye to get you woken up. Yeah, yeah, and it even looked like at one point while in I I don't know I think it look was just kind of messy he looked like he almost like did an eye rake like pro wrestling almost with the glove coming out of the corner yeah which i know they were making some comments about which i think it was just he was trying to separate but just how the gloves are in boxing and just well and you definitely saw that towards the end of the fight where you know it was obviously bothering him and it was flowing very freely from the wound and like he's just taking his glove and just wiping away like i can't see out of this eye because i've got so much blood pouring into it (laughs) right so now moving forward though it's up to deontay wilder to do his business and then they Uh have the they're going to have the biggest boxing match that's on the presumable calendar year for 2020 happening. And no, it's not going to be Canelo Triple G3. I'm sorry. I don't I don't care about what's going to happen. In that How fight. do you feel about that fight? Uh, Canelo, uh, Canelo lost both, in my opinion. So Triple G is 2-0, so why need a trilogy fight? You don't. Enough said there. 
We can definitely get into it on parlay points if you want. I will go full <laughs> boxing talk with no, you. No, you don't. You don't say. Yo, know, I'll go there. Oh, we, we will. But first, we have to close out the show with some locks and leaps, still, mm-hmm. shall we? Pad, you want to kick us off with that? Sure. going to start with my lock. I didn't pick them last week, as I mentioned. For obvious reasons, I cannot overlook this one. Uh, I'm going to go with the Patriots as my lock. As we currently record, they are a 22.5-point favorite against the New York Football Jets. I'm uh, going to go with that one because, well... Uh, Sam Darnold's not walking through that locker room anytime soon. Uh, their backup there isn't going to be walking through anytime soon. And I'll do apologies to their third string quarterback there. You're walking into a lion's den, to borrow a phrase from Coach Duffy. Yeah, without question, that's going to be a bloodbath, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, I've switched over to my leap. I'm going to look at the Atlanta Falcons and the Indianapolis Colts taking place on the early games on Sunday. Uh, as we record, Indianapolis is a one point favorite, so I think the Atlanta Falcons are going to be able to pull that one off. I'm also taking that as my leap, too, when it sure. comes to my turn. <sighs> so am I. Oh, we're all I, leaping. There's nothing. I mean, listen, I'm looking at the line, one and a half Falcons on the road against Jacoby Brissett in playing in a dome. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it really should probably actually be a push. So, but. wait, so you mean nobody's taking the Dolphins uh, as a 21 point fi- uh, underdog against the Cowboys? No, because they won't cover that. I am actually <laughs> taking <laughs> Dallas as my lock. Okay. okay. I'm, are you taking the points or are you leaving the points? I'm taking the points. Whoa! So I mean, I mean we saw, now we saw what happened with the Cowboys against the Giants. The the Dolphins are far worse. Uh, Laura, now, as we know, Jerry Jones still hasn't given Dak Prescott his new contract. First two games haven't helped. The, you know the old pocketbook of Jerry Jones. This game ain't gonna help the pocketbook. This game isn't gonna help, but I believe uh, Gallup is out. Yep, for uh, extended okay. period of time, which hurts. It yeah. hurts my him. fantasy team. Yeah, more. But I think Ezekiel Elliott is going to have a career day. Yeah, num nums. Yeah, yeah, he's going to go off in the wildest way. Um, I'm saying this game could probably be a 24 point blowout. It probably, to put it mildly. So we'll see what happens. And if I'm wrong, oh Cowboy Nation, you're going to hear it next week. <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> Ken, you're going to respect my lock here. Oh, give it to me. I've seen it. Okay. I witnessed it with my own eyes, Pad. Okay. I watched it in Meadowlands. Okay. Nobody circles them wagons. Like yes. Them Buffalo Ooh. Bills, baby. Jump on that ship. Six and a half, six point do- favorites right now against Cincinnati coming into Buffalo. Give me the points. I love it. Buffalo will cover outright. Circle them wagons. There's a table with your name on it, Coach. I mean, Josh Allen is going to throw all over the place because clearly Cincinnati has nothing in the secondary. They can stop the run, yeah, but they got nothing in the secondary. And especially Devil, Devin Singletary, we don't know the status of his injury yet. I think it was just cramps he had. Just, on give, me, just give me Josh Brown. Just get him open deep and connect because he outthrew him against the Giants, which yeah. was yeah. crazy. Yeah. yeah, Josh Allen has one of the strongest arms in all the NFL, so it's scary to see him when he goes deep. And I know he likes throwing deep. So And, you know, you could have gone with New England. Oh, you know, New you could have gone – with Dallas, with the I wanted to go something. I already did the New England thing. Sure, you know I sure. can't pick a division rival in the Cowboys. That yeah. would just be sacrilegious. Yeah. So let's just go circle the wagons, jump off a table, salute, sir, light them on fire, cover that spread. Oh, getting the tables like the Dolphins. It's boys. just warming my heart here. I'm 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 all about this. I'm all about this happening. So before we close out the show, we just got to give a couple quick plugs. Friday, September 27th, Galaxy Brewing Company. We are having the hashtag con season kickoff party going on. Floodlands, Shot at the Robots, Brian and Hearst are all going to be playing. The show information is up on our social media account, so definitely hit us up for that. Find out all the information to attend. The next day, we are going to Robocon, September 28th, uh-huh. 29th. Our panel is going to be 11 o'clock in the morning. We are talking the MCU panel. We are talking everything MCU that you need to know about, and we're going to be live recording. Johnny Moose is joining us, too. So the panel is going to be loud and wild. And the fact that John and I were on the Walking Dead panel last year, and there is not one this year because we shut down panels because yep. that's, that's how crazy we get. Who knows what's going to happen with uh-huh. this one? Who knows? Coach Duffy's going to be in attendance for this one. Let, hey, I, I listen, I might be a sports guy, but I know my MCU. Absolutely. If you remember the first ever entertainment edition of the ODPH, Coach Duffy right, was on it. That's right. That's what's up. So it's kind of a throwback. Uh, Brian Rose is going to be joining us on there as well. It's going to be a wild time. And then following us right after is going to be 3FN with Mike C. from Horror Zone 607 doing a live podcast too. So if you're not at our panels between 11 and 1 on Saturday at Robercon and you can physically get there, you're going to be missing out on a show. 
Mm-hmm. Enough said. I mean, Moose with an open mic. Oh, boy. Yeah, like I said. Last Always a good time. Yeah. Yeah. And he can't be censored this time, so he's just going to go <laughs> completely off. So we might all be kicked out by 1 o'clock. So who knows what's going to happen. More information on that, Robocon.org. So definitely check that out. And to close out the show, we usually close with Fair City Fire. We do have to shout out our favorite band from Austin, Texas. Yes. But there is another band that is dropping an album this Friday as we are recording. And that is Floodlands. The debut album is finally getting released this Friday on Bandcamp. You can go to their social media accounts. We'll post a link up on OchoDuroParleyHour.com, which you should be checking out anyway, for links to Three Fat Nerds and Horizon 607, the Parley Points blog section, everything that you need that is ODPH, and especially the music section, which you can find out everything that is Floodlands. We are going to be closing out with their latest single, Let Us Stray, which is on the album CSR. And like I said, you can find that this Friday on Bandcamp, and you can find the link on OchoDuroParleyHour.com, so make sure to check that out, because that's all we got for this week. So for your coach, my coach, the coach, Coach Duffy. Good night, and God bless Daniel Jones. For Padawan J. Thank you, thank you. I'm your host, Ken M. Thank you, as always, for listening to the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. We'll see you next time. (laughs) 